Hey, everybody. This is Chris. And Kathy. We wanted to take a minute to thank you all for tuning in. We appreciate every listener and are grateful for this platform. Please help us share our vision by subscribing to our show through your favorite streaming app. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at Petability Podcast. You can also support the show by making a donation. Simply go to our show notes and click the link at the bottom of the page of any episode. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to Petability. I'm your host, Kathy Simons. And I'm your host, Chris Cranston. Our podcast provides interviews and information to help your pets live their best lives. Good afternoon, Kathy. Good afternoon, Chris. How are you doing today? I'm very well. Lovely day outside and even lovelier because we have an awesome guest today and an awesome topic. Oh, it's so exciting. I love to learn new things. And, and this realm of you know behavior and studying behavior of animals is fascinating to me. So I'm really looking forward to this interview. Yes, me too. So I, before we get started, Chris, I have one little thing I'd like to share with you. It's actually not even a little thing. It's kind of a big thing. Mm. We, we did a big thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, last month, we were asked to write an article for Dodgerlist.com. And uh, Dodgerlist is a support group for owners of dogs that have disc disease and IVDD education and support. And we wrote an article about our most favorite thing, traction. <laughs> we love traction. And so I think if you, if the audience has a chance, please check it out at dodgerlist.com. The article is called three solutions for improving traction for IVD dogs. Um, and I think you'll find a lot of good information there. So that was pretty exciting to see that we got our little article published in a big venue. <laughs> awesome. Thanks for sharing that, Kathy. you got it. Shall we mention our new sponsor? Yes, yes, yes. Dr. Busby's Toe Grips. So we are thrilled that Dr. Busby's is on board as one of our sponsors. And, you know, just to briefly describe, it's it's rubber medical grade, rubber rings that slip onto your pet's toenails. When those rubber rings make contact with the ground, it provides instant traction. It will improve the dog's mobility and it will help prevent those painful, scary falls. So there are two ways that you can help support the show by purchasing Dr. Busby's toe grips. One, go to our show notes and click the link. It will take you where you need to go. The proceeds from that purchase will go to Petability Podcasts and they'll help to support our show. And the second way is you can go to toegrips.com. You can use the promo code PETPOD22. That's P-E-T-P-O-D-2-2, all capital letters. Use that promo code at checkout and you'll get a 10% discount on your first order and proceeds will go to help our show. We love them. Kathy and I have used the, this product for years. Right, right, right. And visit that website. You'll gain so much information. All right. So, so as we alluded to, uh, we have a great guest and a great topic today. Uh, we always get a lot of traction when we invite people that talk uh, about behavior, training, et cetera, on our podcast. And we haven't had that many guests, but today we have an expert and her name is Dr. Terry Bright. And she's going to be talking to us about stories of behavior analysis, its history and use in a veterinary clinic. So I just attended an online uh, continuing education seminar and asked her to be a guest and she graciously said yes. So a little bit about Dr. Bright. She got her master's and PhD in applied behavioral analysis at Simmons College in Boston, Massachusetts, and is the director of the behavior department at the highly regarded MSPCA Angel in Boston, Massachusetts, where she oversees a robust training program and has a clinical dog and cat behavior practice. The department has three locations and offers 70 classes a week. She sees over 400 private behavior cases per year. That's wow. astounding to me. Right. One that she is capable of doing that, but it also speaks to the need out there. Uh, Dr. Bright is also a faculty fellow in the Center for Animals and Public Policy at the Tufts Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine. 
Her master's research entailed finding whether humans exhibiting canine cutoff signals, I'm not sure what this is, but maybe she'll share that with us during the, the interview here, how canine cutoff signals in humans change shelter dogs' behavior. And then her doctoral research was on developing a functional behavior assessment of dog behavior. And again, this I'm sure is needed, has been replicated, has been used. She is a pioneer in her field. Finally, she created the Safe Walk program, which is a method of training animal shelter volunteers to safely interact with dogs and train dogs, which increased the adoptability of pit bulls in a shelter from 77% to as high as 98%. So welcome, my friend, my colleague, Dr. Terry Bright. Welcome, Dr. Bright. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. And it's nice to meet you, Kathy. And Chris, when you and I met, we became like instant pals. We both were passionate about the same thing. So that that intro was kind of daunting. <clears throat> it seemed like a, a lot of work, but it was. I, I just want to start by saying that my work at Angel is not done in a vacuum. And we have three locations, Boston, Waltham, and Methuen. And we have now up to 100 classes across those three locations every week. I work with another behaviorist at Angel, Jocelyn Strassel. And between the two of us, as you said, we see 800 patients a year. But that's with our, our full-time staff, and we couldn't do it without them. So we are so lucky to have this department at Angel where when a, let's say a reactive dog starts being less reactive, we can bump them into an obedience class or a nose work class. And we can tell the trainer here, this dog is coming to you. These are their issues and they're doing better now. We can do things like take a dog who can't be a class in a class and have them take additional private training from one of our certified trainers. So I feel very, very, very lucky. Dr. Bright, before we get into some of the questions, as you're talking, it's making me think about when I started as a technician. I'm an ANGEL alum as well. I worked there in the radiology department for several years uh, in the mid-80s. As I'm as you're talking, I'm thinking to myself when I started my career and where we are now about what's changed. Are we just simply more aware now of behavior in our pets, changes in their emotional behavior, changes in their environment that... that, that um, are causing behaviors or a result in, in certain behaviors. It's just so much different than it was in the 80s. Like, oh, I would never have thought in 1985 to say, you know what, your dog needs to see a, a behaviorist or a trainer. It just seems like it's changed so much. It's so much more available to people. But what is it that's changed? It's even changed in the nearly 20 years that I've been in the business. I got into the business because I had a little bull terrier named Fanny and I had learned about agility, and I just wanted to do some agility with my bull terrier. Well, I never got the memo that if I'm going to do agility, I should get a border collie that's going to follow <laughs> me around and do what I want. And it took me six years of training and competing to put an AXAXJ on that dog. And those, those are high levels, she got four mock points ever. And before you laugh, that's a big, that was a big deal. A big deal. We, got to, we got to go to the nationals with four wow. mock points. Right. Um, most dogs get hundreds of them. It was very, very hard to train her because she wasn't motivated to do what I wanted. She wasn't reactive. She wasn't aggressive. She was the nicest dog you'd ever want to meet. She just wanted to run another way than I wanted. And so that got me interested in behavior. And then I got a bull terrier who was fear aggressive. And then I got a another bull terrier. Okay, now you know I need my head examined because I had three bull <laughs> terriers. Who was my confirmation dog, Radio. And I became obsessed with dog training. And not for nothing, I was a musician at the time with a day job in healthcare. And working with the dogs was a lot more fun. And I mean this with the greatest respect to my musical friends. It was a lot more fun than playing shows. And so I just decided I wanted to become a behaviorist. It used to be 
that people worked with dogs, and this is to your question, Kathy, when they put obedience titles, agility titles on their dogs, and they really had some training chops. They knew how to train 30, 40, 50 things to dogs. They would be the dog trainers. And there was one or two behaviorists in the reason region, and they were vets, and they could prescribe medication. And that that was about it for the 90s. But then things changed when there became a few more veterinary behaviorists. Um, Council for Certification of Pet Dogs started certifying dog trainers. Others started certifying dog trainers. And many people started hanging out their shingles in dog training, for example. And now so many people have hung out their shingles that I don't even know who a lot of, most of the trainers are anymore. For 20 years, I, I knew everybody. And now that's not the case. There's so many new trainers. In behavior analysis, we welcome diversity. So there's a a pretty small cohort of like 30 to 40 people in the world who are behavior analysts who work with animals, animals in aquariums and zoos, shelters, et cetera. Um, and we, we really think that it's a great science of the future because the science of behavior was born in animal laboratories. So Ivan Pavlov learned, taught us about classical conditioning also known as Pavlovian conditioning. And then B.F. Skinner in 1938 at Harvard discovered the science of operant conditioning or the science of learning by consequences. And so that research came out of the laboratories of these universities around the world into the human world. And those of us who are, who are behavior analysts who work with animals, think it's time that we reverse translate this science back to animals from the human research. Can, would you describe or tell me what the difference then is in the terminology between the behaviorist and the trainer? Yes, that's a tricky question because yeah. there's, I don't think that there's an agreed definition of what a behaviorist is. So, my definition, and it's a commonly accepted one, I think, but there's it's not in the dictionary, um, is it someone who has at least a master's degree in animal behavior and psychology, kind of a combo, along with a lot of experience with behavior problems, you know, aggression, separation anxiety, reactivity, things like that. Um, and has the knowledge of the research that's happening in the world around these things can work effectively with a vet so that they can speak cogently about what's happening with the animal versus a, a trainer is someone at our facility is someone who is extremely fluent with your typical obedience type behavior, sit, stay, come when called, lie down, leave it, loose leash walking, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Now, someone can be a trainer who's experienced in working with reactive dogs, but they're not a behaviorist. Now, what you didn't ask me, what I'm gonna answer is, what's the difference between a behaviorist and a behavior analyst. Ah, yes, please. So a behavior analyst is experienced and trained in finding out why behavior happens. I'll give you an example. Let's say you have a six-month-old golden retriever puppy who they call our office or they tell one of our trainers, this dog is biting me, mouthing me, tearing my clothes, etc. And a behavior analyst would ask a series of questions that would tell them, how did that dog learn those behaviors? How is the behavior being reinforced? So we're always looking at that three-term contingency. So what started the behavior? The antecedent. What does the behavior look like? And what's the consequence of the behavior? That's where dog trainers should ask themselves, what does a dog get? What does a dog avoid? So 
if I say, what happens after the dog puts his mouth on you? And they say, I redirect the dog to a toy. That tells me that the dog is being reinforced for mouthing. That's positive reinforcement, right? So after a behavior, something is added, which causes the behavior to increase in the future. So we would expect the mouthing behavior to increase because it's being reinforced. Now, if I say, what is happening when the dog mouths you? And they say, I'm trying to put his eardrops in. That tells me that the behavior is being negatively reinforced, meaning after a behavior, something is removed, namely putting the eardrops in, which causes the behavior to increase in the future. So the behavior is still being reinforced. So that's an example of positive and, re and negative reinforcement for that behavior, right? right. And there's another kind of reinforcement called automatic reinforcement. And that's reinforcement that happens inside the skin. Um, it feels good. So this is a golden retriever that has to have something in its mouth all the time. And so I'm gonna find out which types of reinforcement are in play before I recommend an intervention. Because if the behavior is being positively reinforced, then I'm gonna use positive reinforcement before the behavior happens. So when that puppy comes flying up to me, I'm gonna stuff a toy in its mouth before it bites. Because what we know is when you use an intervention that matches the reason the behavior happened, also known as its function, you get better results. If it's happening because the dog is escaping having their eardrops put in, then I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna use some counter conditioning for that eardrop putting in so that the dog doesn't have to use what is actually maybe a form of mild aggression to get you to stop. So that's the difference between training and behavior analysis. I can see how people would, um... And I'm looking at my own behaviors now with my dog as you're talking, going, oh, no. <laughs> um, but I could see how I, you know, accidentally or inadvertently reinforce behaviors that I don't want in my in my dog. Sure. It's yeah. he, here's the thing I say to my clients all the time. Dogs have co-evolved with us for thousands and thousands of years. And who is shaping whose behavior, right? right? Because they came closer and closer, and then they were by the fire and then by the dump, depending which theory of dog evolution that, that you support or, or that's the latest. And they got closer and closer, caused us to feed them. And then they were outside in the yard, protecting us from our enemies outside. And eventually they got us to let them in the house and and now they're in the bed, you know? So who's manipulating who, you know? <laughs> My dog's in the bed. He's got a winter coat. He's got everything. <laughs> I had Halloween costume. I don't want the Halloween costume. costume. Right, but yeah. They, you know. <laughs> uh, but I could see how, you know, as I'm as you're talking, how I'm, you know, reinforcing some of these behaviors. You know, my, my dog is very interesting in that um, sometimes, you know, around this two thirty time, he he gets a little bit, you know, he, he gets a little bit antsy. And uh, what he'll do is, uh, if I'm out here, is he'll come to the kitchen and pull down the dish rag off of the off of the stove, which immediately will I will get up and grab the dish rag, and I'll either be like no, or I'll do something else with him. But in hindsight, now I'm thinking he's pulling the dish rag down and, and control and getting me to respond. Yeah, um, and you know, look. Yeah. And he doesn't typically do that with my husband because my husband will ignore it. <laughs> but yeah. he does that with me almost every day. And I'm like, oh, okay. Now I see. Either way, you're getting a response, you know, whether it, it's me getting up and doing whatever, you know, response. So interesting. And so you you could say there are two ways to change behavior. If we put it very, very, very simply, one is to prevent it and one is to apply a consequence. So if you wanted to prevent that behavior and teach another behavior, 
when you sat down to do something else at 2.30, you'd take that towel off of the stove. And when he came in to see what was happening, you'd give him the towel for Mm -hmm. being quiet and for not doing anything. And boom, now you have a different behavior and you prevented it and you've reinforced another behavior to boot, but you analyze an A plus for your analysis, I'll say, um, the behavior and created an alternative behavior that matches the same need. Dr. Bright, when you mentioned earlier with the eardrop example, yeah, and you said you would do counter conditioning. Can you delve a little bit further into that? Um, I'm not sure our audience knows what counter conditioning is. I don't know if I know what that is. So there's there's two kinds of conditioning when it comes to learning. And the Pavlovian or classical conditioning is the effect of something in the environment to cause a physiological reflexive response. So if I got in a bad car accident at a particular intersection where it scared me to death, I had a fight or flight response. And every time I come up to that intersection, my heart rate increases, my respiration rate increases, I have that, I've got to get out of here response. Then counter conditioning would mean that as I came there, At the distance before I had that response, somebody would say, hey, let's take a right here and go a different way. And then maybe another day I'd go a little block closer and be, let's pull over and have a donut. And then another day I'd be like, let's take a left and go to a movie. And gradually I'm making what was formerly an aversive environmental stimulus less aversive by having it paired with something that is pleasurable. That's counter conditioning. Versus, and and here's kind of a pet peeve for me, people love to say DS slash CC. So desensitization slash counter conditioning. Mm. And they're two different things. Desensitization is also Pavlovian. And it means that you're exposed to something that's potentially aversive to you, but at a distance at which you can tolerate it and it's not aversive. And this is Black Beauty. Remember Black Beauty when he was afraid to um, be a cab driving horse in London? He was afraid when the cars came. And so the cabbie took him out to the farm and put him out in the field with the cattle. And it was next to a train track. And the train went by twice a day. Black Beauty almost had a heart attack. The cows didn't even look up. But over time, Black Beauty became desensitized to the train. And so it was no longer aversive to him. So desensitization is being at the distance of something that's potentially aversive such that you become used to it. It's called habituation. And counter conditioning is when something pleasurable is given to you when you're at that distance at which it's not aversive. So are they done together sometimes a lot? Yeah, but they're two different things. Would an example of that be, um, because I've heard this many times, a dog is reactive. So a trainer with their person takes the dog to a park and there is another dog at the park and they keep their distance. So the reactive dog is feeling safe, I guess. And, and so they have it escalated and then they'll, you know, they'll walk back and forth and then they offer them treats for looking at them and not paying attention to that other dog that's across the park. Mm -hmm. that's kind of a combo, right? So one is... Well, let let me... That's such a good question and something that that I have strong feelings about. We we don't do it that way per se. Um, So a, a couple of things. Behavior analysis is the science of measurable and observable behavior. So even though we know dogs have feelings and they certainly show us those feelings with their body language... We're, we're mostly looking at what the dog looks like when they see the other dog, you know, and are their hackles up? Do their, is, does their musculature change? 
Um, and that's a real common intervention is to ask the dog to look at me instead. So don't look at that other dog, which is aversive to you. Look at me instead. Now, I don't ever do that because if someone is afraid of something in the environment, let's say you're afraid of clowns and here comes one and you can see it, the circus is in town and here's someone in a clown suit five blocks away and your heart starts pounding and your partner says, oh, don't even look at it. Don't even look at it. That's not going to work. It's not going to work. No. It no. doesn't work, right? And so I never ask an animal to look away from something they're afraid of. Instead, I start feeding them immediately. So it is pure counter conditioning at the moment. If the dog will eat, then I will feed them until the other dog is gone or they can't see it. If the dog won't eat, you're too close. They're not going to be able to learn. Um, and then, and that's your classical conditioning. And then Kathy, you're right, because the next thing that happens is operant conditioning takes over because that dog that your dog sees now becomes what's called a discriminative stimulus or a stimulus that means a good consequence is possible. Positive reinforcement is possible. So your dog sees 40 dogs and gets a cookie around dog 41 or 52 or however many it takes, your dog is going to look up at you and say, where's my cookie? I see a dog. And now you're in operant conditioning. Mm -hmm. And it's happened naturally, which is so much better. It's so much mm -hmm. better. And we have really good luck with this. Do you, would you say that, because I read an article that it, where you made a comment that the science applies to organisms everywhere. Would you say that, you know, if you, can we apply the same principles to our cats or our pet bird, or um, can we work that with them as well? You bet. And, you know, I, I teach, you know, I teach at Northeastern and, and the one article that we read is about shaping blowflies to walk through a circle in a piece of plastic using sugar water. So if it works with blowflies, you, you know it's going to work with birds <laughs> and, and with cats, you know. Yeah. Um, the, difference, uh, the difference, honestly, with cats especially is that um, we, in, in behavior change and using reinforcement, there's something called motivating operation. So how motivated is the organism to work for that reinforcer? And cats are not very socially motivated. So... Um, they kind of tell you when the training session starts, they tell you how long it's going to be. Mm -hmm. You know, they have a tendency to like walk away in the middle of it. But I I love training our cat patients because the, the ones that we see who are aggressive, I love cat aggression cases. They are real good to train, easy to train because they're already manipulating the environment in a big way. So we love um, to train cats. And we had, we don't have it now. We kind of got blown out by the pandemic, but we had socialization and training classes at Angel for Kittens called Kitten Kindergarten for a couple of years. That's, That's cool. Like a fantastic thing that I would like to be involved in immediately. <laughs> okay. I'll see what I can do. <laughs> I just want to play with the kittens. <laughs> yeah. You know, Dr. Bright, one of the things that, um, that I've, I've said time and again is that when I found canine rehabilitation, it was so good for me because I loved my psychology classes in college and I loved my pets and all the animals I knew growing up. Happened to learn physical therapy techniques along the way, but it was such a, a, a great marriage of my interests, you know, in terms of animals and, and then, you know, you're talking about Skinner and Pavlov and all that. And it's bringing me back to, you know, my, my classes. And I remember we had um, one class, I had two rats that one, I, I think 
I don't know. I shouldn't even say this, but one we had to be very structured with in terms of its reinforcement and documenting everything. And then what we learned, we applied to the other rat and we got to do whatever we wanted to train them. So I trained my rat to go through a vertical maze. And then we brought in uh, grade school children and showed them, you know, how we had train our rats in in college and it, it obviously it still s- sticks with me as a very, a very positive reinforcement <laughs> well and i think it stuck with those word. children too i mean i re- you know i just had kind of a flashback we had cocker spaniels growing up and we had this beautiful little perfect cocker spaniel of course her name was buffy and my mother had me take her to an obedience class and I was so happy I was having so much fun with Buffy and I one day I got to class and there was my teacher and you know I was at that age where it's like oh my teacher you're so excited to see them and me and Buffy go strolling up to the teacher and apparently she was I realize now she was doing a down stay with somebody else's dog and she just looked up and she snapped at me, the, the teacher, and said, don't ever approach me when I'm with the da da I was like, gosh, I guess I don't love dog training after all. You oh. Know? Mm. It's so sad. Um, <laughs> punishment can be yeah. scary. It can well, change behavior. Luckily, it wasn't permanent. <laughs> yeah, there you Thank go. Goodness. Yeah. There you go. So I think it's, it's always good to refresh people's, um, or teach them, the like the four quadrants is that what it's called so again you've talked a little bit about positive reinforcement so you add something that is of positive value for the pet and it increases that behavior right that an- antecedent behavior well here's here's the tricky part okay the the word positive doesn't have to mean good right so so um if if you are the smartest one in class, but maybe you're a little shy, and I say, Chris, your homework was the best in the whole class. Thanks for turning it in. I'm going to show it to everyone. I'm going to insist they all do it. And you stop turning in your homework. Then mm. my comment somehow was a punisher. It wasn't a reinforcer. We measure reinforcement and punishment strictly by its effect on behavior in the future. Mm-hmm. Right. So back to my four quadrant ideas then. So yes. you have you add something, you take away something. Yes. Can you go through that? Yes. So the words positive and negative are math. They're the hardest math you have to do in behavior analysis, which is great. So you when you're talking about positive reinforcement. After a behavior, and this is, remember, that three-term um, contingency, three-term contingency, antecedent behavior consequence. So after a behavior, the consequence is something is added that causes that behavior to increase in the future, then positive reinforcement happened. If after a behavior, something is added, which causes behavior to decrease in the future, that's positive punishment. If after a behavior, something is removed from the environment, which causes the behavior to increase, that's negative reinforcement. If after a behavior, something is removed, which causes behavior to decrease in the future, that's negative punishment. So let's define these a little bit more, especially the punishment side. So negative punishment, the easiest way to remember that is timeout. You get a timeout. I'm removing you from the environment or I'm removing myself from the environment. The consequence is your behavior decreases. So had a a case in a house um, some years ago with this Pitbull, who we all love so much, and he lived in a house full of teenage girls. And this is when those Ugg boots were like the thing, and everyone in the house had them. And boy, did this dog love the Uggs boots mm-hmm. too. So he would grab them, everybody would chase the dog. And we, 
assess the behavior. We knew it was happening because of the attention that he got. And so she's now our operations manager, but Susan Conway, um, who's also a certified dog trainer, went over to their house and said, here's the deal. When he gets the Ugg boot, everybody leave the room. And there were like five people in the room. So we they casually left a boot out. Sure enough, he picks it up, starts shaking it. Everybody left the room. He dropped it and stood there like, what happened? <laughs> And they started doing that all the time. And he stopped eating their Ugg boots. He didn't get what he wanted. He got a timeout. Yeah. They removed the people and the behavior decreased. So let's let's talk about the the other positive one, which is positive punishment. After behavior, something is added, which causes behavior to decrease in the future. So very controversial, right? Because some trainers use aversive stimuli to change behavior and some don't. So it's it's like religion and it's it's too bad that it's so controversial but but there we have it. The side effects of punishment are what keep most behavior analysts and academically trained behaviorists from using it because they are increased aggression, fear of the punisher, attempts to escape the area and these kind of things are, they're hard to deal with. You know, you, you don't want to use a punisher unless you know what the side effects are going to be. And the side effect of, of using an aversive stimulus, let's say you have that dog that barks at other dogs and you give them a big old collar correction, any kind of collar, something that's aversive, what's he looking at at the time it's the other dog and you can actually increase aggressive aggression because that other dog now becomes a discriminative stimulus that says, I'm about to get it. And they will increase their aggression to try to make that other dog stay away. So we tend to not use those kinds of of stimuli because of the side effects. It doesn't seem like it makes very a very good uh, dog handler relationship as far as uh, your pet or the trust in, in, in each other goes to me. Um, it seems like it's it seems like it might break down that trust relationship. No, you're exactly right because if if you know what was my relationship like with the dog trainer who yelled at me when I was a little kid, you know? It it's frightening and if and if you frighten an animal that you can't apologize to later, you know, if you if you say snap at your spouse in some way, later you can say, I'm sorry, I wasn't mad at you. I was mad at somebody else and you were in the way. You can't say that to a dog who you just yanked um, or frightened in some way. Mm-hmm. And you become potentially aversive. And some dogs, it's hard for them to recover from that. Yeah, it makes me, you know, you're, giving great examples. And I'm thinking you said one is um, that, that they might try to escape, you know, the, the situation or become, you know, fearful of you. And I can just think, you know, back in the old days, you know, my mother, even, you know, if, if our little Shetland sheepdog did something naughty, you know, she'd go and get the newspaper and whap it on the butt. Mm -hmm. Well, it didn't take too long before mom's running around the house chasing the Sheltie because you know, now she's afraid and she's trying to escape that quote punishment. Right. So, you know, it's just, we, we've come a long way. Mm. When, the, a long when, way the Caesar, when the Caesar Milan show came out all those years ago, there was somebody um, that I knew who became quite enamored of the show and was just doing all the things they saw on the show. So the dog to them was like so well-trained, but this, this woman said to me, and, and I, I try not to get involved unless people ask me, but she asked me one day, she said, gosh, um, you know, my dog is so well-trained while I bit my tongue. And she said, but you know what I wonder, when we sit down to watch TV at night, the dog goes and lays and sleeps in the other room. And I thought to myself, well, I would do. I would too. Mean to me all day to get me to do those things, you know, right. she didn't get it. Her dog was avoiding her. Yeah. Sad. Really. So can we um, 
Can we talk about some of what some of the most common behavioral issues that you see and treat? What are the most common things that are that you're seeing and how do you assess these dogs in clinic? So the most common ones we see are forms of dog aggression. So dogs aggressive to other dogs, dogs aggressive to people. Um, we see a lot of that. And, and we have a really long intake form, which helps us to assess what's happening, um, potentially what's happening. But, but we use, we're, we've actually been running a study for some years using a model dog or a fake dog, you know, made by Melissa and David, that company, um, to assess a dog's reaction to another dog. If they're reactive or aggressive, then we will expose them in our clinic room to like a stuffed Labrador retriever. Um, and the first hundred dogs we did were was a black dog Labrador retriever named, called him Andy. And then we asked the owner, is that what your dog would look like when they saw another dog? Because their dog has a reaction, you know, they forwardly aggressive, defensively aggressive, bite the dog, do they sniff his tail? Um, and it allows us to see if that's what the owner is seeing. And when we did the study with Andy, we found that of the 100 dogs, 90 of the owners said, yes, that's what my dog would look like. So that was a pretty high percentage. Mm -hmm. um, now, we're since the pandemic, we're using a yellow lab, her name is Sandy, and we're only at 80%, which is, I don't think the types of cases we see any are, are really any different, but it's going to make us look hard at the color of, of these dogs. You know, if we get to 100 dogs and Sandy's at 80% and Andy's at 90, what does that mean? You know, you can't see their eyes. They you know, ah. it's, it's so interesting. Right. So that's one kind of assessment. And then when we're in the clinic room, which is like 12 by 12, you're assessing the dog the whole time, you know, just watching it, watching how its owner um, interacts with it. You know, the dog barks, they give it a cookie, dog barks, give it a cookie, dog barks, give it a cookie. You're like, I don't know why the dog is barking so much. <laughs> Let's talk about it. <laughs> right. It, you know, in preparing for this, interview or chat today i thought back to a, a dog that i treated in physical rehab um it was a corgi named corgi and uh the owners were very transparent about that you know he is not a good boy and they i forget why he was coming in but mainly we just swam him we did hydrotherapy and you know we could navigate that pretty well because you know they have a life vest on and so we can you know kind of control them and he loved to swim and he chased the toy and all of that but we had to be really careful when toweling him off when putting on the life vest etc mm -hmm. and but every time he even you know turned uh, instead of telling him, you know, when he was being good and quiet, that he was a good boy, if he started to to react in what they perceived as a negative way at all, it was cookie, 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 you know, here, Corgi, here, look at you, here's a cookie, here's yeah. a treat, here's a, yeah. Yeah. And, and again, I thought they're reinforcing him being a bad boy, you know, and the worse he got, the more cookies they gave him, right? Like if he growled or barked or, you know, then, then the... And in their mind, I think, and isn't this true what a lot of pet owners think is that they're, again, um, distracting them and, oh, now they're eating the cookie, they're not going to bite you. So they think they're doing a good thing, but to the dog, it's, as you said, causing the bad behavior to become more frequent and or escalate. Yes, if it's if it's behavior that is learned like that, then then you absolutely can teach a dog to bite you instead of letting you put the eardrops in. You know, some behavior, if it if it's real fearful behavior, then feeding them even at the lowest level of it can provide some counter conditioning, you know? And and so so there's that. But training a dog who doesn't like to be handled to be handled and you know this more than anyone, 
is a long, slow process that right. involves lots of distance, lots of treats, and lots of telling the dog when they're getting it right so it becomes clear for them, right? And keeping them from needing to be scared. Mm -hmm. It's very, very tricky. When should people reach out for help? I, I, I saw that you made this statement, which was so great that you wished you were an elephant trainer because if people had an elephant and it was behaving badly, they'd come to you right away. Uh, so when do, when do clients reach out for that help? What's the signal? What's the time? So quite often, since we're in a tertiary care center, it's because they've been referred by their vet. And quite often it's because they have a serious problem. Quite often people are referred to us by their vet because they've seen a number of different kinds of trainers. Sometimes they've been to board and train. Sometimes they've used aversive stimuli, even um, rewards-based training, but they're not getting the results that they wish they had and they want medication. And I'm not a vet, but the vets know that medication is only effective with a good behavior management plan. People have often seen a lot of different people before they come to us. And, and it's too bad because some of the situations have worsened because of the treatment that they've had or because so much time went by and the behavior had the opportunity to be reinforced many times. So it's it's too bad. I I I would love for more dog trainers to to get academic degrees and learn about science like behavior analysis and have a mentor where they can learn about how to see behavior cases rather than experiment with cases that they're not familiar with. Yeah. What are your thoughts about um, rehoming? Because I hear this a lot. So uh, my dog, uh, you know, uh, knocked my child down and I can't get the dog under control. And I'm thinking about rehoming. Is rehoming an actually a good option for dogs? Or is the rehoming actually traumatic for them? Will that increase that behavior? Or are we looking at maybe it could improve the situation? Well, it, it depends on the reason. So um saw a case this week with a pretty young puppy who was already a pretty severe resource garter and did not want to be handled, could not be groomed by the owners and offered to help them, you know, wrote a whole behavior plan to them that said, you know, this is a tough dog for you and it's going to take a lot of work to help him. And they returned that dog to the breeder. Um, and it, it was a puppy. So Who's to say what will happen there? Hopefully the breeder will get the puppy the help it needs before they rehome it. Um, if you saw the, the CE that we did, we had a case of a, a little blind dog who bit the baby and not badly, but still they were having another baby. So it was going to be two babies and a challenging small blind dog. And that dog was rehomed. It was sad for everybody, sad for the dog, but the dog adjusted. The problem is if a dog has is has bitten and broken skin, is in danger of aggressing again under similar circumstances, now you're running up to an ethical bump as to whether that dog should be rehomed because most people are not looking for a dog that will bite. I hear what you're saying, Dr. Bright, about, you know, sometimes, you know, dogs will return to a shelter or return to a breeder and then they're you know, it's not always transparent about the dog's history and then some unwitting adopter uh, inherits a, a behavioral issue. Um, Kathy and I have a mutual friend who's who's very good at training and such, and she just uh, got a dog after her last one passed. And because she boards and trains and everything, her one criteria was this dog needs to be good with other dogs. And oh, you know, the the rescue, oh, she's wonderful and so forth. She is not. She is aggressive to other dogs. She does not want other dogs around. And so our friend is is considering rehoming her after she gets through her, her surgery here. So I know. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. Yeah. I mean, the last thing you want to do too is see the, you know, get yourself a dog off of Craigslist or something like that. Oh, because gosh. we just don't know. We have no idea what the circumstances are in that dog's home. And it's unfortunate that that happens, but, but that's the last place I think we want to. We had a client with a small dog who was very bitey. And she said, I should have known when they handed me the dog with a pair of big leather gloves that went to their <laughs> elbows. Oh, no. That's a red flag. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, you should have. Wow. If you have to take your dog home with cat gloves on. <laughs> that is a red flag. Buyer beware. <laughs> but buying a dog on the internet, I mean, is not what it's cracked up to be. Never mind right. Craigslist. That finder in all these places, you are buying a dog on the internet. So. Right. Yeah, right. I tell people you just if don't you want know. a dog without those problems, buy a three year old dog from a board a brick and mortar. Brick and mortar. <laughs> yeah. Facility versus this. Yeah. And yeah. You, know, you have someone help you pick a dog. And right. all those dogs that, you know, we're in New England and we have the Underground Railroad or whatever, yeah. all these dogs coming up from the South, right? Yes. Thousands. And, you know, people meet them for the first time at a, at a truck stop. Yeah. And, you know, you really don't know what, you, what you're getting. So no. it's right. tough. You know, one thing that I heard kind of come through again and again as we chatted here was, you know, behavior analysis and the need for people to study this academically and, you know, provide sound advice and and resources. Um, you know, animals, pets are just becoming so integral to our lives. We're expecting them to do things that aren't natural for them and so forth. And I remember I had a, a young lady, she was in eighth grade and she was writing a paper and she called me at Flow Dog and said, you know, can I interview you? It's for my class. And I said, sure. And at the end of the conversation, I was quite taken with her. She seemed very mature and knowledgeable. And, and uh, so I said, would you like to volunteer, you know, at, at Flow Dog? And, and yes, she did. And she continued to volunteer as she could uh, well into her college years. And she became an employee. I eventually paid her money to do all the wonderful things that she was doing with me. But um, in the end, so she thought, you know, I, I probably want to work with animals and, and you know, I probably will become a vet. And I know when I was growing up, that was the only thing I really thought of, you know, a vet or a, a veterinary technician. But there are so many parallel careers that are equally important now. And sure enough, Sarah is now a trainer, but I think she, I mean, she studied it in college. She went to um, University of Pennsylvania and worked with a, a program there on cognition and working with uh, service animals and things like that and worked with a very renowned person in Wisconsin because she ended up settling there. But I thought, wow, I wish I would have had, you know, or known, you know, of these things like you created your own path, Dr. Bright. And so I hope people hearing this can, you know, maybe pass this along because a lot of people I know, they think, you know, what I do is wonderful, but a lot of people say, I don't, I, I don't think I could be a vet because I don't want to see, you know, the sad things and, and, you know, I could never put an animal down. That's always kind of what I hear. And, but there are so many other uh, career options out there to help pets. And, and this is certainly one of them. So, well, there um, three colleagues who are also certified applied animal behaviorists from the Animal Behavior Society and I some years ago were asked to write a book chapter on alternative ways for behavior analysts to work in the world. And ours, of course, was animals. And two of them had started with humans and then learned about dogs. Two of them had started with dogs and then learned about humans. And I wound up writing the intro to the chapter, and I used a quote that was a story about King Arthur who told his knights, if you go into the dark forest and there is a path already there in front of you, that is not your path. That is someone else's path. And I think that's most meaningful to think about when you talk about trying to find your way in working with animals, because there's another saying I love, which is proceed as the way opens. As you go through your life, things will happen, which will be a path that is now your path. And look where you wound up, where I wound up, Kathy, where you wound up. And you, you just don't know. There's 
the way opens sometimes when you least expect it. And if you can become a conditioned positive reinforcer to those around you, as I have at Angel, then lots of times you can get your way and make good things happen for you. Right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Even in your personal life, I find myself, mm -hmm. you know, to my partner going, good job. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I really liked, like what you did there. You know? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we learned so much today, Chris, and um, it was wonderful. I think it's going to be fantastic uh, for our audience to listen to. And, you know, as we close the show, we always ask our guests if there's one thing they'd like to share, any any success stories, any pearls of wisdom, anything you'd like our audience to know. I think the most important thing is to keep learning. For example, um, I decided to teach Ribbon, my dog, how to do her own nails. And so I've been doing it with a salesman's metal clipboard. It's going pretty well. That to me has been a fun adventure. She's not an agility dog. She's too fearful to be an obedience competition dog, but she still can learn. And now she's learning how to do her nails on the sandpaper board. So keep learning, keep studying, and if you have a question about, about learning about behavior or something, feel free to reach out to me. It's tbright at mspca.org, and I will hook you up in any way that, that I can think of. That's very generous and kind. And uh, again, we appreciate your time, your expertise. Can't thank you enough. Thank you, Dr. Bright. Pleasure is all mine. It's good to see you both. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed our show. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at Petability Podcast. For more information about Kathy's books and living with blind dogs, please visit EnableYourPet.com. Thank you, and please tune in next time.